Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. I'm Stephanie Valdez, owner of Community Bookstore and your host this evening. Tonight, I'm very thrilled to be collaborating with our friends at the Seminary Co-op Bookstores in Chicago, Powell's Books in Portland, and Third Place Books in Seattle to welcome Jesse Ball for the pre-release of Auto Portrait out on August 16th from Catapult in conversation with Max Porter. Now to some housekeeping, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We'll be asking those at the end of the program. There's also a chat box through which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. One upcoming event I wanted to point out on Saturday, August 20th, we're collaborating with Third Place and the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith to bring you Brenda Lozano and Heather Cleary for their novel, Witches, in conversation with Catherine Lacey. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So tonight, a little bit about our guests and we'll get started. Jesse Ball was born in New York. He is the author of 16 books and his works have been translated into more than a dozen languages. He is on the faculty at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, has won the Paris Review's Plimpton Prize for Fiction and was long listed for the National Book Award. He was named one of Granta's best of young novelists and has been a fellow of the NEA Creative Capital and the Guggenheim Foundation. Max Porter is the author of three novels. His fourth, Shy, will be published by Grey Wolf Press in spring 2023. His work has been translated into more than 30 languages, and he frequently collaborates with artists, filmmakers, and musicians. He lives in Bath, England. I'll turn things over to you, Jesse and Max. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the bookstores uh, hosting tonight. It's a real joy. Um, it's very late in the UK and it's a very wonderful thing to think of you all a little bit earlier in your day. Tuning in. Um, welcome Jesse Ball. Um, it's really a pleasure to see you, my friend, and to celebrate this beautiful book. Uh, how are you? Good. Are yes. you? No, go. I was just thinking that you have the the um, galley, so you don't see the uh, wonderful uh, illustration on the back. I like it a lot. Take off the jacket, show me the boards. There's an impression on the... I like it a lot. Good job, Catapult. So this is out on the 16th of August, yeah? I think so. Um, Jesse, I wanted to uh, say how much I enjoyed this book. Um, like I enjoy all, all your books, but this one particularly felt like I was in your presence. I was in your, in your good company and and found it like I wanted to argue against the book uh, in the same ways I've wanted to argue against you uh, sometimes, but also been delighted uh, and, and um, faintly addicted to the book in the same ways. I, and I, I found myself faintly addicted to your company when I'm in it. Uh, you have a drug-like effect on me, um, which is worrying and, and wonderful in equal measure. And I want to, uh, to talk about lots of things with you this evening, but I think maybe the, our first aim should be to get this impression to the people that have joined us this evening of what that is like to be in your company in this in this act of self-portraiture. Um, so I've written a few pages down that I uh, that interested or um, engaged me particularly, and I wondered if I could just give you a page number and you read us that page, and then we can discuss that page. Absolutely, let's do it. Are you happy to do that? Page 53. Thought she was pretty. One of my shoulders stands higher than the others. 
My left hand is quicker than my right, but weaker. When I played soccer for my high school, I scored goals with both feet. Once I scored a goal on a corner kick. The goalie caught the ball, but landed inside the goal. I was named the athlete of the week for my high school. People thought this was funny because I was such a loser. I like the notes that irascible old writers write about wanting to be left alone. These are often typed on typewriters and that pleases my eye. I also like sets of rules that were posted in workplaces in the past, newsrooms, gambling dens, etc. When I worked as a croupier on a reservation in New Mexico, there was an old man who would strike me under the table with a cane if he didn't like the cards he got. For some reason, I did not report him, although it happened many times. Other croupiers I spoke to had shared my experience. Likewise, they had not reported him. A man wanted to fight me once for taking his money. I told him he would have to wait until my shift was over, five hours later. When I went out to the parking lot, he was not there. Um, a brilliant and a slightly absurd thing has occurred, Jesse, which is that we have different page numbers. Oh, I see. Like, so my whole strategy of asking you to read pages and then me responding to them is... Um, it's just shot straight out. But it doesn't matter because any page in this book is good to talk about. If you if you can tell me what the first words on the page, I'm sure we can localize it in almost immediately. I think perhaps the pagination will have been changed. Maybe the typesetting nudged everything on a page. I'll give you a paragraph and we can talk about it, okay? All right. Um, I sometimes think that not enough information about toiletry, the wiping of asses, is shared. I feel someone must have a technique that is substantially better than the usual method, and I'm curious about what that is. And this, for me, is a neat summation of your genius, because I think it's one of the great mysteries of the world, and it's more or less entirely taboo to ask about the ineffectuality of the common method of wiping the ass. And as a child, I was always completely baffled, and I felt that there must be some great secret that I wasn't in on that this could not be when we can fly to the moon and we can develop microchips. We cannot all be struggling around, at least in our part of the world, with this technique. And as, even as an adult, I think, uh, how, can it, how, how can I not have gotten any better at this? Um, and I wanted to ask you about the sense of private knowledge, cultural knowledge, or esoteric knowledge, erotic, philosophical knowledge, and the sense of the cruelty of a society in which some people are have access to those secrets and some don't and how the whole thing is a farce because no one has access to these secrets and how your writing in different ways across poetry and prose has always been simultaneously trying to get at that and also not care in the least bit what that is what that is what the secret behind the closed door is um and i'm sorry to start this discussion with the wiping of asses but it seems to me profoundly important well, in, in this case, almost any activity that you, you could think of, even one that you think you're reasonably good at, you can go on YouTube and almost you know, instantly find someone who's impossibly good at that same thing. So, for instance, uh, I don't know if you ever saw that video of Tiger Woods where he's just using a golf club to keep a golf ball mm. aloft, mm. which seems completely impossible. Mm. And I, I've always had the... Um, real sense that there must be a tiger woods of toiletry you know and but his secrets are going to the grave with him or her secrets as it were but as for the um i don't know the one of the things i like so much about the levé is how the construction of the book permits things that ordinarily would not be sufficient to say in a conversation to be said you know and, and furthermore, there are so many things that we, um, we know about ourselves, but the, we don't have any, any sense of what those um, others' capacity for those things are, or what others' whims regarding those things. And, and we, so don't deem those, we don't deem those things adequate or of, sign or, or, of, of sufficient worth to air in conversation or in art. We'll take like um, Nabokov's memoir, which I love, you know, Speak Memory. 
in some sense, you could say that this memoir, Nabokov, is a, um, a very long argument in favor of Nabokov being incredibly smart. And it's an argument on behalf of that, you know, of the, the absolute um, pervasive fertility of his memory, you know, which mm -hmm. is like an iron, an iron um, trap. I think he's talking about at some point, he's like nine years old, and he has this, you know, exquisite long passage about riding a bicycle and meeting a girl on a particular day and all the details of what she was wearing, etc. I'm not going to disbelieve him that he remembers it because mm -hmm. you know, his capacity for uh, processing information seems to have been absolutely enormous. But one does feel slightly like you've been taken by the scruff of the neck and you've been shaken when you read memoirs of this kind, uh, whether it's like uh, I mean, memoirs of Chateaubriand or, or you know, they're, they're always um, valorizing. And so the thing that I loved so much about the Levé was it resists that human bias for self-valorization simply by resisting narrative. And so I thought, I don't know, why not give it a try? Do you think it's a puncturing of the kind of pomposity of the literary, the artificiality of the literary mode of, of, of memoir anyway? that you're injecting different types of truths that brush up against the more conventional, thus artificial mode of, of valorization or whatever it is, or, or false memory with something domestic or scatological or purely funny or, 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 or daft. Do you think that it's just, a, do you think it's a, it's, it's, it's the elements of the collage that are, that are doing that? Definitely. I mean, I think to some degree, it's probably still possible to write I mean, it certainly is possible to write a, an auto portrait that would be full of um, fluff where you're just saying nice things about yourself. But I think it would be dead on arrival, you know, almost immediately because it hews quite closely to the statement fragment or to the anecdote. Mm -hmm. And I think we just don't, as humans, we don't really like to hear people tell stories about themselves that mm. don't end in that person's humiliation. Mm. But we love hearing about people's humiliation, you know, Louis C.K. or whoever it is, you know. And I think, I think maybe it's sooner obvious that, that um, the, um, the qualities and the immediacy of the hum humiliation is, is, comes, comes to the fore because the constructive units are so small in this. Whereas in something like the Bokov, you can be lulled by the technique and the long, you know, prose and the descriptive, you know. and and also there's a kind of a um, a feeling like because and I don't want to say anything against that book because I love it, you know, mm -hmm. to speak memory, but I certainly would never want to write such a book. I mean, there are some books that you you want to have written, and others that. Uh, you're happy it exists. For me, one book I always wanted to have written was the um, Barbarian in the Garden by um, by a uh, Polish writer, uh, Zbigniew Herbert. Have you read that? No, I've read the poems. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. This, um, it's a travelogue. He goes to um, the caves with the prehistoric art and travels. Uh, there's a long section on the Albigensian heresy and it's, uh, just incredible. But when you read some books, you're full of like a fiery jealousy from your toes mm -hmm. to your, your head. You know? I've only had it a couple of times. I had it with Agatha Christoph's The Notebook. Me too. Yeah. I wanted to to kill <laughs> until it's I could have the, it. Come on, come on. For me, it's just the first one. The later yeah. two. Yeah, oh, yeah, all yeah all no, the other two don't work. Yeah. Jesse, I want to um, I want to ask you um, a little bit. You said something about the idea of the, uh, the the valorizing memoir being dead on arrival if it were to take um, if it were to follow that logic of memoir. And I want to ask you how and why yours is so alive on arrival. Um, but before I do, just for people that don't know uh, or haven't read this book yet, um, can you talk a little bit about Edouard Levé and, and and the book you're referring to for people that don't know that you that you've quite um, explicitly based this on his approach. Yes. So, and it was it was the, it wasn't the last book, was it? It wasn't the the, the it was the suicide. penultimate. It wasn't the suicide book. It was the penultimate one, right? Well, Edouard Levé wrote a 
a few books, one called I think, Newspaper, one called Works, one called um, Suicide, and one called Auto Portrait. He might have written more. I'm not a, um, you know, a thorough expert on him. I mean, more that were unpublished, but the ones at least that we have in English, I think, are those. And I think the translation of Auto Portrait is by Lauren Stein. It's quite a wonderful um, translation, I think. But his, I would say you could place him really in, in a liminal spot between art and literature. So he's, it's even problematic, I, I think, to call him like purely a writer. Works is a series of ideas for art, art installations. And I think even in his auto portrait, he, he refers upon occasion to different um, like museums he would like to have founded or other things like this. He's quite, his, his frame of mind is quite conceptual. At any rate, he liked things like, a, you know, keeping catalogs and lists and um, archives of various kind. And so he wrote this book before his death. At 39, he wrote an auto portrait, which was a list of, well, it's hard exactly to call it a list. I guess we can call it a list. It's a, it's a series of statements, one after another, that together, coalesce to a form of portrait. So it isn't a memoir and it isn't a, um, you know, autobiography. It's just a, a clump of things. But they do give a quite powerful and I think inescapable sense of, of a person. And so the book I think is a little bit of a cult favorite in the US. Mm -hmm. And I had read it and loved it. Um, I like all of the things he wrote. And then I realized that I was 39, just as he was 39 when he wrote his. And I thought, well, just for, you know, just for a jag, let's try to do an auto portrait. And so I decided to do it the same length as his and the same way. They're sub substantively different, I think. Um, his maybe has a bit of a more detached tone, colder tone. I think mm -hmm. maybe I'm um, a little more, I don't know, engaging is not, not the right word because he's completely engaging, but um, maybe I <laughs> reach out my hand to the audience a little in a slightly more friendly way. Um, but I don't know, it's hard to judge one's own, one's own work. Um, in, 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 the texture of, in the texture of the piece, that you call a clump. One of the attractive things for the reader of the of a piece like that is that they they bring the life to it themselves. They animate it themselves through their identification or revulsion or suspicion or the allure of of, of some of the ideas that are being presented. And and, and it's the, and it's the juxtapositional energies between things that are quite philosophical and things that are quite comic or things that are quite serious with things that appear to be quite funny. It, is that an effortless thing for you to create? If we think of the book as a sort of tapestry, uh, does it, does it, do you write it in order and have a sense of when it needs to be tight and when it needs to be loose and when it needs to be, when you need to reach your hand out to the reader to warm it or when it needs to be colder in, in the sort of conceptual mode as the leve is? Is this an, is it an automatic thing for you? Or is it the, 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 the way you write a poem? Maybe? Yeah, the, the flow of it and the structure is something because because we know it's a given that there will be uh, a series of non sequiturs. Uh, there isn't so much concern about the the overall weight of the thing, but I think there is an ongoing tally, and that tally one keeps it in one's head as as the writing is happening. And so I think this moves towards maybe um, occasionally it will guide us towards a um, moment of um, minute expression, you know, in the direction of something profound or towards humor, if it is built up too far in the other direction. I mean, I think that, but I, I think it's, it's something that's just natural to storytelling. You know, um, I feel like if you are in the presence of you know, one of the many homers reciting Homeric, you know, thing, 
it wouldn't surprise me at all if there were a bunch of jokes that are interposed randomly throughout the thing for the, for the audience, you know, um, uh, like a, a baby cries in the middle of the performance and the, uh, you know, the, the griot like points and says that, the, you know, this baby will have its head cut off. Or yeah. something. Well, someone um, goes for a shit and comes back and goes, how on earth are you supposed to wipe the human ass? <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that, I think that is, um, it's, it's natural to feel that there's an absence in the, in the story and then to, to find the thing that will fill it. But for my process, I just started at the beginning and tried to, um, tried to keep going until, until I got to the end. I think if I did it again, it would be fundamentally different. I wouldn't do it because then it wouldn't match his age at the time. Um, somehow that seems like the crucial thing. You know, they were both 39. But yeah. let's say I had done it a week after, or a week before, or a month before. I think the facts that are in it, many of them would just be different because these happen to be the ones that came to my mind. And your temptation to keep it going as a permanent document in your notebook so your phone isn't there. Oh, no. You have your usual um, healthy attitude towards the finished project. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I wrote it in one go and stopped, and that's that. But of course, I mean, as you said about the, this is these are the kinds of things that I would say to you if we were sitting to have a you know a drink. We talk about these same kinds of things all the time. You know? So it is. Um, I don't know. I guess the heart of it is that my love of literature is a love of the company of people who I I feel are um, somehow sympathetic to me, and it ha you know it it happens in this world that. We only meet a fraction of the people that are that, that live at the same time as us, let alone this gigantic number of wondrous people who lived before. We have no chance of the people in the future, you know. But for the people in the past, we can have some of their company if they were writing. You know, so I don't know somebody like Herodotus or um, or Plutarch, mm. you Sappho, you get some of their company, and mm. and it's wonderful. And so. Or, or Montaigne, you know? And I think that more so than like the elements of a good story or this or that, the quality of mind of someone who lived long ago, to mm -hmm. receive that quality of mind gives me the comfort to, to like wake up in the morning, to have, have that company. And so I think that's one of the things that I like so much about the Levee, this man who yeah. killed himself is no longer exists and yet could, could give me his cheerful company. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the ultimate measure is, does the book give this sense of company or not? You know? um, I'm just reading a book about Theophrastus, who is, um, you know, Socrates, uh, uh, psychic disciple, uh, who has categorized nature and botany for the first time, kind of invented science in some, you could ar arguably invented science. And it's by Laura Beatty and it's based on that idea. She goes looking for him and she has to unlearn, you know, where she tries to see the sea through his eyes. She has to unlearn modern shipping. She has to unlearn meteorological data. She has to unlearn very focal spectacles and to try and get close to him. And that effort is, is profoundly absurd, but also, um, incredibly rewarding uh, 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 and generative in a thing and so I wonder I, I, you know I know it's boring to just ask you oh you write your books quickly and then other writers go oh well, surely he doesn't what a fucker you know he writes them in one day but but I am interested in if, if you write the book relatively quickly then you are basically going searching for yourself you're searching for the boy that you were and, and various different iterations of your personality both as a writer and as a human being along the way does that flow for you? Does that come easily? Well, I think because I I understood with your novels that 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 you would you would you would think about them for a year or two, you would have some notes, but then ultimately it would be I could I could understand having spent time with you how those novels could just be placed on the page, almost almost as a musical gesture, as a performance with with the focus that you carry around with you. But with this book, I was more perplexed by the sheer act of, of remembering. And as you say, it might be different facts if you wrote it on Tuesday than you wrote it on a Monday. But I'm interested in the quality of your memory. Is it all just there? Well, as I said, I, I think it would be different depending upon what day because the, um, you know, 
you know, the, the atmosphere of waking up in the morning would have given rise to a, a different first statement, and then it would lead to a series of, of different things. But I think, um, I mean, of course, there's the, uh, the hagiography of our own lives. You know, some some version of that probably would always appear. You know, um, I think. But one of the old definitions of hagiography is to improve on an existing literary product. And I like the way that you're sort of doing that, but not for propaganda reasons, but for spiritual reasons, despite <laughs> being a religious text, right? And you not being a religious figure in your own mind. I, I think it was easier, to, to your question, it's easier to write this kind of text. Um, probably it's easy for anyone to write it because the style has, you know, it has, other than maintaining the, like, the tally and the ledger of, whether you have, you have um, you know, imagining the audience and, and their emotional reactions to what you're saying and keeping it to, um, so that it's not, you know, trying to be too profound, not trying to be too funny, not, not pandering, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same way that you would when telling an anecdote, I think apart from that one responsibility, you have the entire length and breadth of your life to just bring statements out of, you know? Um, so it could be your annoyance at the um, I don't know, forks, like the time, the times of forks are always too dull. They should be sharper. All forks should have sharper times, you know, and um, all plastic implements in the U.S. that are designed um, once in a factory and printed millions of times, you know, on machines, they should have a beautiful design at the start. They do in Japan, you know, but yeah. in the U.S., we, they're all shit. <laughs> They're garbage forks. And it's like, yeah. if you're going to print something a million times, you know, so there's just so many like funny, interesting facts about the world and, and our interaction, our preferences mm. that um, I think are just worth, um, maybe they're not worth like stopping someone in the street to talk, talk to them about the times. But if you have this little unit of just saying mm. one thing, and saying another, and saying another, you just sort of press on. And I mean, you know, from, um, from, from poetry, in poetry collections, so often it's the case that the collection as a unit is, is an incredibly beautiful unit because it permits small poems that can't stay afloat by themselves this, this space to live and exist. You know? And so you, you can have like, you know, mammoth poems, like um, beautiful, you know, um, four quartets or something, you know, Soviet, you know, but many, many of the, really wonderful books, I don't know, uh, think about like Elizabeth Bishop or something where you'll have the, the magnificent big poems, but then these small ones in between mm. that mm. give some character to the whole. And I think that the unit of, of auto portrait allows these small things life. And, and I think you're absolutely right. But the tendency, you know, like the, a poet you mentioned when you read in, in this book that you read one of the living, maybe you say the only living poet you greatly enjoy is Alice Oswald. She was concerned with some time that the collection itself was um, a damaging, um, that the cohesion of the collection, and uninterrupted poems one after another by the same author was, was dangerous, both to the poem and to the reader's abilities. Um, and so she started posting individual poems to people on, on an airmail paper. And I had a tendency, which, I, which I've been very cynical about in the past, when I was reading this book, to want to photograph individual paragraphs and send them to people I love to say hey this is my friend Jess's new book I think you'd like this bit uh and and I, and I wondered how you feel about the kind of self-anthologizing like the, the sort of tendency towards aphorism and how you resist that how you resist writing particularly in in this book where, where you're where, where you're writing small chunks to create a single single whole how, how you resist the tendency towards the tweetable to the to the digestible do you know what i mean how that's what i mean about the texture of the whole because it has i don't want to use any like architectural language but it has it has a, a rigidity a, a, a strength a, a robustness to its whole that belies its tweetable parts if you see what i mean well is that a horribly offensive thing to to say about something as carefully worked as this it, it do you know what i mean it, it 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 you're very mean about rivers i was joking before that you're very mean about rivers but it has 
the aerial strength of the river with the movement, with the kind of constant movement built in when you are closer to the water? Well, I think there's something, uh, you know, any, um, anyone who finds a little bit of, even the smallest amount of literary success has the, the appalling uh, occurrence that some quote has been drawn from something you've written and then is repeated ad infinitum. And it's always something that you didn't entirely mean. Maybe it was in the voice of a character or it's something that you <laughs> certainly don't agree with. Yeah. And then it will be posted again and again, like um, whatever quote it is, you know, um, and then your name, as if you announced it to the world in a court yeah. proceeding or something. Not one of your sickest and stupidest characters making it, a joke. Exactly. So this is a great, this is a great danger. Um, but I, I think, you know, that's part of the, that's part of the deal. People get to you know, excerpt whatever they like, but to your, to your point about, um, persuasiveness i think that when i when i was starting to write like with uh, march book or with the, the earlier the earlier books that i wrote um, especially up to silence once begun i really wanted to write these um impassioned powerful lyrical statements and to reach these moments i don't know the the great writer of this kind is maybe rilke right yeah where there are these formulations that um, immediately feel timeless. Yeah, it's like right. being like being having your entire body fastened inside of granite for a moment, and then being allowed to walk again. You know, you feel his his grasp on you. You, know? you must change your life. You know, and I think that after that, I started to to go in the direction of the plane. And, and away from that. And I began to really love work that is not persuasive. Mm. So I wanted work that was not persuasive. There's a writer who died last year, David Graeber. Mm. He wrote uh, Dad. He was sort of one of the um, Occupy Wall Street guys. Yep. Martin, really great um, thinker. I think he wrote uh, um, wonderful books about anthropology and anarchism. But, and the thing that I always kind of held against him that I didn't like was that he was so persuasive. His writing was always completely persuasive. Mm -hmm. And I agreed with him. I agree with almost all the things. Yeah, that yeah. Said. it's an agreement, yeah. yeah. But, but I, I hate when someone doesn't provide me with all the arguments to disagree with them. Mm -hmm. And, and he's so, um, he was so persuasive that I felt like I want, in, I always wanted in, in my books to, to give give enough room for someone to be like against me just as mm. much as for me. Mm. I think Beckett is a great one for that where he he's not he's not doing anything to make you like him, you know. And it could it could very easily be that you hate, you know, immediately and then he wins you over. And I think Harold Pinter is like that too. Mm. Um, and maybe Dickinson. Emily Dickinson, Dickinson a little bit too. Dickinson, totally, I think. It's so, so, so rare these days, um, partly because of the sort of strength, the, the allure of approval, both as, a, both as a, a, an economic imperative, as you say, being, being republished or re, reacquired or re-liked re or re-shared. Um, can I get, we've got some cool questions coming in that I want to get to, but I want to just ask you uh, to go to some other pages with me. But because we don't have the same pages, I'm going to have to just read it to you again. Well, I, I like to hear you read it. Um, I disagree with you about Renaissance painters. And uh, I think that you say that you yourself draw boxes again and again and again for no real reason and don't want to move beyond the iconography of the fox in the hooded jacket. Um, and yet you critique Renaissance painters for moving in the shallow world of um, religious imagery. Well, they have the excuse that they're getting paid. I don't have any excuse. Yeah, but um, I'm actually collecting all your fox drawings that you left around my house and, and I'm going to paper them onto the ceiling of a chapel and then you will get paid. Because people <laughs> need it. Um, this is... Um, okay, 77.
when I'm at dinner with people I don't know, I try to get them talking. I want to say the least I can about myself. Often I can learn really interesting things from anyone at all. This is less true of powerful men who have a series of intermeshed routines that they will unfold for you. Suffice it to say, there is not much to learn from that. I wanted to ask you about the series of routines within masculinity, which you which you so successfully nail there, and and the kind of death death of feeling that is associated with it for for those that have identified it as a problem. But also, I wouldn't mind asking you to widen that out into the culture industry, into the routines of book production, book performance, book reviewing, book, book sales, prize culture, perhaps any of the things, any of the, the routines which we unfold um, blind to their counterproductive nature or to the, the harm they do us as creative people or, 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 uh, or, or their sheer or the sheer ludicrousness of their of them as rituals, uh, as templates needed to be packed and shared again and again and again blindly uh, as if as if there's no alternative as if there's no funnier messier um truer or, or, or more ambiguous alternative i think the root of the root of it is that um we have we have intentions for what we're going to do but then the thing that comes out when we actually do it is largely beyond our control and different from what we intended. And that's good. It's good that it's that way. And it's to the benefit of those around us, you know, that, that randomizing element in our um, you know, psyche, our mode of speaking, all, all of that. Um, this came from that, that, I guess, the engendering um, moment was that I had done a, an interview with a guy who was a memory expert mm -hmm. uh, long ago. So. I mean, I did the interview long ago, but then also it took place, his, his life as a memory expert was from the 1950s on, I believe. He was sort of a Borscht Belt guy. He would show up at, you know, these like um, colonies. He could do things like remembering a thousand people's names, you know, and, and then shaking their hands on the way out. And I had come up with these really great, I thought, questions, interview questions. And I called him up and was trying to have this interview. And any question that I gave him, he would immediately like, slip off to the left and then begin something like a, like a 15 minute you know, statement. And it wasn't even that his statements were not engaging and interesting. It's just mm -hmm. that they, had, they didn't have anything to do with my, my questions really. And so I felt like- And you didn't have someone, you didn't, you didn't forgive him that slightly as someone that her, her, you didn't see that as a, a protective packaging he had to, to don? No, I, I did, I, I certainly did. Um, it just, I guess what it meant is that if I were to, I don't know, like, let's imagine I was going to make a nonfiction documentary about him. It, it just means that it would take substantially longer to create an interview that would draw him out past those things, you know, and in his case, potentially never. He had so many of them, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I think that the, you know, to, to answer the other part of your question, the, this, like, prearranged processions that we can trot out at a moment's notice you know, about our past or about a, um, a life or our work or the prearranged ways that like, book covers are done often or the way that things are marketed um, even even down to which books are chosen or what books are on prize lists it's all part of the um, I think a perversion of, of the um, capitalist money system that um, just gives it, it gives too much money to the wrong aspects of the business you know and I think um, like obviously the profit to to go in the direction of profit means to attempt to do again something that was done before yeah and that um, that striving to, to to just repeat previous successes I think is a mm -hmm. kind of cancer, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, we must distinguish thoroughly between like folk tradition and tradition in general, where the striving to repeat something from the past was often just because it was giving joy. And mm -hmm. so the shitty things would fall away and the joyful things would continue. So you get something like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is just yeah. wonderful from beginning to end because all the, the, the crap fell away. Mm -hmm. But this is not the case with whatever the like, 
19th book that arrives trying to be the same as Gone Girl or whatever, you know. And so I don't know, I, I would like to see, if I could see something different in the, in the publishing industry, I would like to see more prizes for, for strange books, you know. Yeah. Uh, Kavina says something in the six memos for the next millennium that, um, like what, what the purpose, what literature should do, you know. And I, I think that um, it is important for literature to do things that other other mediums can't do. Yeah. So you shouldn't try in literature to do the things that can be done in film. Mm. And I think um, neither of the things that are done in painting. To my mind, the transcendence of literature is in showing our perception of the world as, as it stands, as it yeah. is, which is a layered perception of many instances of time at mm. once mm. Um, shot through with all the possibilities of what is about to happen so it's a it's, it's an incredibly amb ambiguous tapestry at, at every moment where the ambiguity is um you know is the heart of the, is, is is the tenderness of the of the project right the, and, and it's lightning solid. It, the, ambigu the ambiguity is lightning solid because everything is specific. It's like you have, um, you're going to turn the corner. There are 30 possible things that you're imagining that could happen. Mm. And there are 30 different specific things. Now, in a film, it's really hard to show that. But you could have a, you know, a text where you have 15 pages to go one by one through all the possible things that you think are about to happen. You know, yeah. and so I think that there is a, um, a fundamental difference between how quickly we experience the world and then the, the speed of mediums. And so the, the writing, we have the chance to unspool some like absolutely incandescent moment into all of its length and beauty. And so for me, I, I get incredibly bored if. Um, if uh, if a book is not doing something that only a book can do, yeah, yeah, um, I couldn't agree with you more about that. I'd say it's like a working definition of why I write books. Um, for the ambivalence and the space, it, the space it creates that other art forms can't. I'm just going to read you one more one more little thing, and then we've got um, really lovely questions. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit. You say a really lovely thing in here, which seems to straightforwardly say what no one else says, and I, I loved you for it. And I, and I, it came a couple of pages after your um, knocking Sigmund Freud off off the bookshelf, and I, and I, um, I sort of thought of you as a, a kind of Diogenes, um, you know, just patiently coming to the market square. Of, of Western philosophy and Western culture and just repeatedly showing how, how foolish we all are. Um, but, but, I, but I was moved by this because of its right clear-headedness and its compassion and, and, the, and the way that your cerebral ambition is always uh, totally at ease with your open-heartedness um, uh, and, and, the, and that pain is, is, a, is a fun thing. Sadness is a fun thing to experience and, and, a, and a complex and interesting and addictive thing to to to, to do and to, to nurture within ourselves to be heartbroken and um and and guilty at the same time as ma manically arrogant or you know you talk somewhere in this book about being like <laughs> incredibly pleased with yourself and also totally sickened <laughs> and i just thought no one gets that quite as right as you ever anyway um someone has let you dissect a hand he, he brought me in and let me cut it up. The inside of the human body, the inside of all bodies is remarkable. It is not disgusting. What is disgusting is behavior of human beings, the proliferation of military technology, the quest to reverse aging, et cetera, et cetera. But the shapes of things in the skin that holds you, will you just speak briefly about that deafness of touch that you seem so brilliant at that, that seems to be deeply connected to the kind of musicality of your thinking, the little give, the little take away, the little, the little, the blowing up of the balloon, the sudden popping of it, not for shock, for, for truth. Just talk a little bit about, uh, cause you, 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 like, you're the only person I know that speaks candidly and truthfully without any pomposity or, um, 
or you know about the prison system uh, or about corruption or injustice or you know you, you're you're totally at ease talking about things that other people um, find very like find very difficult because you're not trying to persuade you're just saying what you see would you talk a little bit about that that dynamic in the work the the the, the human body is not disgusting well I think but the arms first is first one first one thing I can say about many of the statements in the book is that it's quite possible to say the thing and then the contrary thing also mm. and to feel both of them so for instance about the renaissance painters um i both like can thoroughly object to them but then also you know the amount of time that i've spent staring at these paintings and loving them you know is, is enormous um so theoretically i would like to make all statements and their opposites at the at the same time generally but but that will be a trickster literature and you're aiming for something more something more beautiful aren't you oh no i don't want to say them at the same time but like yeah. over the course of a series of visits mm -hmm. i would be permitted to to contradict myself yeah know? like like lee is fool yeah come back tomorrow <laughs> yeah. and tell me the opposite but as for i, I don't know i think My impression of, of the day-to-day -day existence, and not just of my own, but of what I glean from other people around me, is that it really is just completely bewildering. And so we we pretend, uh, everyone is constantly pretending that things make sense, and they don't make sense at all, you know? So you have some, some poets of this senselessness, you know, like um, maybe two of the great ones are Hafiz and Rumi, you know, who both are like really adamantly aware of how silly it is that everyone is agreeing that things make sense and that, you know, um, are constantly unraveling costume, essentially. We're wearing a constantly unraveling costume. Mm. And so the ramification of that is not that you should go around puncturing everyone's things and telling everyone that they're stupid, because life is hard. There's no reason to make things like worse for everyone or difficult and you know for some people it's it's hard enough to um, to wake up and go to their job or whatever you know but it is nonetheless the case that the more we can become acquainted with the um the honest version of what experience is like and the more we can gain and learn from others you know, perception of this bewildering cataclysm that is every moment to moment and all of our worries and fears and our hopes and the, the sweep of the mind in nervousness and passion i think the more directly people can experience their own lives which are i think constantly sacred mm -hmm. and i don't know i have one of my friends thinks and i agree with him that humans i believe used to be smarter than they are now and the, there's a number of, there's, a, uh, there's evidence for this, for instance, our brains are smaller than they were before. So I think as scavengers, we had to live more immediately and we had to remember more things yeah. and we had to remember them with less language. Mm. And that language had to be, of course, there was no writing anything down. So he thinks the alphabet was the beginning of the end for, mm. for people. And I kind of tend to agree. And so, I, I do think that uh, one of the ambitions of, of the work that I do is just to, to show that the, um, the, rootless, the rootless sort of uh, scrabbling about in the dirt that we're doing is, is acceptable. And we don't have to pretend that it is something other than it is. It's fine. And in fact, the more you can realize how fine it is, the finer it is. Mm. So... There's nothing like seeing, I don't know, um, someone mastered by an ideology mm. and wanting <laughs> wanting them to, to be able to come out of it, you know? Mm. Mm. But uh, much less five billion people. Mm. Mm. That was beautiful, everything you said. Um, you know, my 
honesty is my religion uh, alongside trees. So I feel when I was reading this book that this would be one that I would clutch to me like a prayer book, like a, like a book of common prayer that means that I can travel with Jesse more often than real life allows us. Um, but also that I would bicker, ask myself the same questions, propose the same, you know, play fool to your leer and vice versa. Um, and um your, your generosity of spirit is um, really singular. I, I've selfishly kept you talking for too long, so I'm going to whip through these questions and ask you to give, if not single word answers, then real brief ones, yeah? But first, um, on, on camera, as we are now with people watching, maybe I can get you to agree finally to writing a book with me. Yeah, of course. Done. Excellent. That's an epistolary, an epistolary novel. Oh yeah, I'd love that. We were meant, we were meant to do it, right? Yes. But didn't I immediately just start drawing pictures the last time, and then you just drew a couple of foxes, and we called it a day? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No, let's do it. I need, I need actually, the, actually, the structure of an epistolary novel would would be good for me because I am my time is my enemy, so I the discipline of writing a letter will be good for me. Uh, my uh, my friend at uh, Martin, who I knew at university when we lived together, we, we there was a board game called Eternity that was released on the millennium, I think, and it was, I think, a thousand or two. Sorry, it would be, it would be two thousand little tiny triangles and a load of little bits of plastic, and you had to piece them together so they all fit, and, and there was like one in a million chance of it ever being solved, and if you solved it, you won a lot of money, and we just pinned this thing to the wall and drew with a tiny, tiny fine line of pen in each of the triangles. And it took us a year, and a year and a half, two years to complete. We would do a triangle, you know, there in the morning and a triangle when we got home and then we'd have a smoke and do another few triangles. And it became a kind of um, meditative uh, ritual for us. Um, so if we could do something like that, that would be really, really good. Whether it's language or images, I don't know. Anyway, come on, Jesse, this is like, um, this is like a game show now, okay? Wake up. Can you please ask, oh, this is for you. This, I'm gonna hand this to you that she's like politely, or well, this person has politely asked both of us, but I'm, I'm gonna hand it to you. Maybe you already said it actually with Rumi. Um, can you ask Jesse for the, your favorite poets, songwriters of the sense of humor? And do you like James Tate and David Berman? I think um, Lost Pilot was one of my favorite books when I was around 17, 18. I was obsessed with all first books and uh, as young poets often are and yeah. in fact i guess i continue to be obsessed with first books first books are really where, where it's at um, even if the first book is quite late like harmonia or, or whatnot they still tend to reflect some something magnificent but comedy and poetry yes i think uh, I, I like david berman and and james Tate. i think charles Simich. i really enjoyed his his comedic poetry and I find Philip Larkin's poetry be incredibly funny. Um, so yeah, Philip Larkin would be maybe my number one funny poet. Okay. I read a Philip Larkin article about John Coltrane that was so offensive I've never found him funny after that. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, don't don't look that article up. You'll go right off Larkin. Um, I, I, I'll just chuck in a recommendation from the UK. There's a there's a, a brilliant novelist and poet uh, pal of mine called uh, Joe Dunthorne whose poems always make me, I, I, I never laugh really out loud when I'm reading, but Joe's poems make me laugh out loud. They're clever, they're perfectly clever. Okay, we've done that. Um, Jesse, the way you describe writing Autoportrait, which I have yet to read, my copy is on its way. Nice one, Karen. Um, makes me think of musical improv. Does that ring true to you at all? That, I certainly, certainly musical improv. Improvisation, but um, maybe there's a certain amount of, I think, re rehearsal, like unintended rehearsal mm -hmm. that is implicit in the reading process. Like you, you read, you read so many books and, and passionately, and you have an ongoing uh, wheel that is turning the head, giving uh, like plausible renditions of speech, which might or might not like occur in reality out of your mouth and then when you go to write all of this i think coincides and the thing comes out and and in the moment of writing it's 
contr is controlled and given measure by mm -hmm. the passion for the technical, which is yes. the, the, um, the syntax of the language, the, the feeling of the weight of words, like Frost talks about the sound of sentences, and that allows for the flow. Mm -hmm. and, and an acceptance also of the, the way in which um, no word has any, there's no meaning. Words don't have meanings. Like dictionaries are kind of uh, like false in the sense that they give supply a meaning for a word, but a word is just the totality of usages of that word in the language. And each time you add, you use the word again, it's given a new meaning, a fresh meaning. And so in this sense, um, like the misuse of words, the use of words, all of it, the uh, you know, language should be broken as it's used, I think, like a broom. Karen, you won't find a better answer to that question anywhere in the world. Chuck says, one of the things I love about your writing is the clarity and brevity of the sentences. Um, did you drive inspiration from poetry, literature, journalism? You might just have to everything, say yes. Everything. I mean, not, not only not only the, like, the so-called you know, departments of, of art or anything like that, but, but all things, you know, things we're certainly past any um, any world of, of high art or high literature. Um, so all the things, whether it's uh, you know, pornography, smut, um, advertising, or, uh, copy, um, the things you heard at a bus stop, um, everything. It's just the life with its teeming multiplicity. You want to just catch catch some part of it in a cage and then you know send it to the printer we we were at a festival in australia you and i and uh a, a, a schoolgirl stood up and asked the question where do you get your ideas from and someone was a bit snooty about that question and said oh you're not really supposed to ask that question and you and i agreed that it was the best question in the world and we gave like a 25 minute long answer each of us <laughs> just listing wonderful places where you can get your ideas from <laughs> well i i love the australian audiences because they will ask the most um not only good questions, but sometimes obnoxious. Like the, yeah. there's a, um, the position of being a person in an Australian literary audience asking a question is fundamentally different from the position of being an American um, with a microphone about to ask a question. And they really feel like they're ready to hold the, hold the person on the stage accountable for almost anything, you know? Yeah. Like, Which is the least we deserve. I love it. I love it. This is a, you might have to, um, give a quicker answer than you want to here. Jesse says, Sarah Kirk, I'm such a fan and avid reader of your work. My partner and I are translating sentence by sentence your novel, The Children's Six, which is only available in Spanish. I'm so curious about your decision to publish this book exclusively in Spanish, your relationship to the language. Do you read, write, speak it? And anything else you could quickly share about that? Um, my Spanish is, is quite poor. I did study it for a number of years in high school. But I have a wonderful publisher in, in Argentina, uh, Sigilo, and a, a great translator, Virginia Reck. And my books have done pretty well down there, certainly better than they have done in the US or in, um, where they're <laughs> used as doorstops or whatever. Not even good doorstops because they're so thin. But I think what happened is that the publishing industry in the U.S. tends to be more conservative and tends to move slower. And in the um, in Argentina, I think the readers are more adventurous and also more philosophical. One of the issues with the, I think the U.S. Uh, reading public is that we have a complete lack of um, philosophical education, and so uh, our literature tends to be rather rudimentary in terms of the, its conceptual framework. And so if you write books that have um, you know, any kind of uh, philosophical intent, um, it immediately is more a part of a European literary tradition or a mm -hmm. South American literary tradition than it is a part of the US literary tradition, which tends to be based on um, uh, culture, which is U US culture, um, a literature of events, a literature of uh, dialects. And, and so it happened that Children's Six, which is a, a sort of more conceptual novel, um, could find print sooner, I knew, in Argentina, and perhaps never find print in the US. Mm -hmm. And I really liked this press, Sigalo, because they had um, you know, championed my work there and 
um, Virginia had sent me such wonderful questions as she was uh, translating the book that I thought, why not just let them have it and let them have it alone? And so I thought this book will be in Spanish. And I was even thinking maybe if someone needs to translate it again, like if it will be in Turkish or something like something like that, that they should translate it from Virginia's Spanish. Yeah. On that one. I love when that happens. Um, we, we're out of time, so um, I'm just going to let this one, Sarah Watson said a really super nice thing, and, and someone uh, uh, someone called Andy has said, Jesse, you're my favourite author, and it's so meaningful to be here. I'm curious, have you resisted auto-portraiture or a sense of self in previous works before this book? And what is it like for you to engage in this, and what is it similar to the way that you wrote Census? So that's going to be our last question. Thanks, everyone, for asking these questions. We really appreciate it. I tend to be, I think, somewhat private person as much as I can be as uh, um, as an author, and so I, I suppose I don't think though that I resisted using personal details or personal life narrative um, for the reason that uh, I had a distaste for it, or for the reason that I was afraid of it previously, but more so just because my. Um, my general mode of, of writing, which would be quite bare, like a few adjectives, um, etc., just doesn't it doesn't lend itself to very interesting, I think, um, descriptive text about a life. So one of my favorite, I would say, my favorite, um, well, two two of my favorite books of biography and of autobiography. One would be Thomas Bernhard's uh, biography. And then the other would be the Oscar Wilde book by uh, Elman. Both are just teeming with detail, you know, mm. and that had never been my mode to write something teeming with detail. And so I think that's probably why I avoided writing about my own life, because I'm I'm more drawn to parable, folktale, um, these kinds of uh, conceptual boxes. But auto portrait gave me a, a mode and a method, so. I um, uh, I just, um, I won't even give you any platitudes, Jesse. Uh, these books, you know, arrive, um, you know, in my life, in my head, and in my and in my life, and in the, you know, in in this, in this, the way I'm in with my children and my dog and other people, and um, the way I read the world, they they just arrive like solidarity, um, like um, companionship, and and wisdom and uh, I, I'm just uh, delighted that that, that 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 you write that you give us these gifts um, they're miraculous books um, thanks to community bookstore uh, for hosting and and also um, thanks to the seminary co-op uh, and Powell's and third place for this um, for this beautiful team effort um, the book is available next week oh, you must buy it and, and and it says in the chat here that there, there's going to be signed book plates in all the stores that we've mentioned. Um, Jesse, do you want to say anything in closing? Well, I would like to thank you Your for. Fan. I would like to thank you for doing this uh, horrible task of uh, talking to me about the book. Um, <laughs> it was very kind of you, and thank you to all all of you for joining me and listening to us babble on. I hope that you can find something lovely in the book, and if you can, then I thank you for that too. I fold it down almost every page of this book <laughs> um all right then we're done i'm popping on just to say um thank you so much for this lively and unformulaic conversation um it was beautifully intimate for zoom and um thank you for just doing it anyway um books are available and um, thank you both for spending the time with us. Thanks. Thanks for those nice questions as well. Goodbye. Good